everyone. some background music and we should be live all right let's go Hoffman Charles uh, let's see ah oh, Luke that's um bit too pro for me. Oh man, that's a truck and a half. <coughs> Excuse me while I quickly get some braid food. I say it would have been pretty downbeat poetry. <clears throat> All right, so we ended up with this lemma. <clears throat> well, eight viewers. Surely we got more than eight people watching. <clears throat> Maybe we're still having lunch. Yeah. Um, yeah, only one person tried to join the Zoom. Um, <clears throat> uh, surely I didn't set the, uh, the Zoom link for now. Let's see. Okay, thanks, Space Kidder. That's why they got it mixed up in the schedule. <clears throat> Alright, 14 people, that's sounding better. Hello to all the, the people rolling in. This is just what we had at the end of last lecture. <clears throat> just going to give a, a specific example of um, how this situation arises that we looked at. Okay. All right, well, we've got 14 people. People can quickly uh, jump back into the video to see the beginning. So, <clears throat> to recap, um, we talked about um, some generalities on long exact sequences and some short exact sequences of cochain complexes and um, 
sort of had this general construction that said given any map of of cochain complexes we can uh, cook up its kernel and its co-kernel which are again cochain complexes and <clears throat> um, if you know that uh, the map of cochain complexes is for instance subjective so this can oh the lag okay that's better is um wow the zoom is lagging that's really bad all right <clears throat> if each of the the maps in the uh the map of cochain complexes is subjective then we get a short exact sequence of cochain complexes so we get this in uh, for an example in the following way so just draw a little fence I'm gonna say uh, this one so for example um, <clears throat> so if I have uh, a, a delta set I call this map a name call that I a sub delta set so uh, a n sits inside x n for all n then we call this the these two X and A together a pair, a pair of delta sets. And then uh, we have the map, the restriction map. So I'm going to um, not write down the ring R so much these days and sort of implicit that it's there. And if I have a specific one in mind, I'll pop it in. So we have the restriction map. Like so. And this is um, this is in each degree it's subjective because we can always extend a function by zero so we have a function on a n we can always just extend it to x n by saying it's zero everywhere else so this is subjective um, <clears throat> and so we can look at the kernel of i star which is itself cochain complex and we get a short exact sequence like this and then so we can define so this is something that's somehow intrinsic to the the pair x and a So if I have to write the coefficients, it will be a C bullet X comma A uh, <clears throat> um, Alright, and then if we have a cochain complex, we can define its cohomology and this gets called the relative cohomology of the pair. Uh, X first. Um, all right, <clears throat> so if we stop and think about what this cochain complex curve of I star is like, it's all the, uh, the on the, the n simplices of x on xn, <clears throat> right, it's the functions on xn that restrict 
to zero on a n. So in some sense, it's like I want to do the the cohomology of x, but ignoring everything in a. So this is, in one sense, we're like, <clears throat> imagine I didn't have a in x, or better to think of it as imagine I've sort of somehow shrunk a away, and then whatever's left, that's what I'm looking at the cohomology of. Because um, delta sets are so rigid, uh, it's very difficult to have quotient. Um, yeah, Chris, it's not quite excision. Um, <clears throat> but we will get there. Um, we can't squash A down to a point, right? Because if we had a map of delta sets from X to something else, right, the... All right, so technically, if I want to write R, it's like this. Oh, sorry, you're uh, Yes. Thank you, Tyson. That should be an A. Um, yeah, so we can't squash the tetrahedra, the simplices in A, down to like actual points, like actual zero dimensional things. But this is like the next best thing. It's like I'm taking the virtual quotient. So if the quotient where I collapse everything in A to a point existed, this should somehow be its cohomology. Because like the cohomology of a point is nothing, right? Except a little bit. So there's there's a small wrinkle and so we can um we can define a special case of this which kind of bridges the gap in the intuition a little bit. So so special case Right, let's take a equal to a point. Um, so this is like a zero equals something, and a n is empty for positive n. And let's not call it star. Actually, let's call it um, x. Where x is a specified zero ver zero simplex, a vertex, if you like, of x. Um, we can define the reduced cohomology. Um, is so this gets h twiddle x comma little x. So a lot of this stuff you got to maybe think about by um, context um, is defined to be okay. The notation maybe looks a little bit silly, but it's the relative cohomology of that pair. Okay. Or maybe we want to leave little x implicit. We might just say uh, h twiddle. So later we'll get to a point where um, <coughs> uh, for topological spaces we can define this in a slightly different way, and it really is completely independent of little x. But it's to some extent independent of little x. Okay. Um, so here's a first property of this. So I said, imagine we squashed the general case A as a subdelta set down to a point, which we can't do, but imagine we could. Um, like any sort of element in cohomology, it still has a value up to being, uh, you know, an equivalence class on that point. Whereas uh, this relative cohomology, it's like everything on A is literally zero. So the, re the point of reduced cohomology is like I kind of any um, remove that last little degree of freedom.
So um, here's here's an example. I oh, know I'll, I'll give the give the um, the lemma first. So it actually doesn't change um, the cohomology if n is positive. So this is the inclusion map because the left hand side is defined to be a kernel or some of like evaluation at x. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of first point. Second point, the uh, reduced cohomology of an actual point um, well, it only has one element that you can pick. Let's just call that star. This is equal to zero for all n. So before we saw that uh, like delta zero, the point is the cohomology is trivial except in dimension zero, where it's um, measuring the fact that this is a non-empty delta set. Um, space Kitter um, it's is it related to fundamental groups of contractible spaces? It's um, it makes cohomology a bit more analogous in that sense. So, if anyone who knows what a contractible space is, um, all well, it's I'm going to go out on a limb. So, if you don't know this, ignore it. But for a contractible space, well, its homotopy invariants are trivial, but its cohomology invariants are trivial except in dimension zero. And so, um, reduced cohomology sort of fixes this in some um, vague sense. So, a point is a boring space, but ordinary cohomology, as we've been discussing so far, Give something non-trivial in dimension zero and so if we want to say like delta zero is super boring i don't care about i don't want to see non-trivial cohomology modules for a single point this gets rid of the like last remnant um, <clears throat> so as an example of this let's take a directed graph that's a polygon then uh, h twiddle 0 of gamma doesn't matter what coefficients say z is the trivial group and h twiddle 1 the z coefficients is z so when we calculated it uh, sort of in the tutorial then we found both of these were Z but the polygons connected so should we really be um, assigning it sort of zero dimensional cohomology something non-trivial you know it's it's uh, depends what you want to do but this um, this variant on cohomology tells us uh, it's once it's once it's got something in it I don't care um, about having only one component so uh, another example um, so I pop this in the summary notes as just a bonus if we have a directed tree it means it has no cycles say a finite directed tree uh, then it's well it would be contractible in the topological world Uh, but ordinary cohomology h0 would be z but here h twiddle 0 reduced cohomology is also 0 all right so the probably thing to think about it's a slogan so um Yeah.
Now I'm not taking a vertex out of the graph. What I'm doing is looking at the, I'm putting an extra constraint on my cohomology. So I'm not extracting it. I'm, I'm sort of virtually magicking away the whole component that contains that vertex. I have two tilde's, uh, so worse I have two H zeros um, that eraser. Yep. Yep. No, come back. is somehow quite old definition of a functor I don't get this software rip stream all right <coughs> riffs in chat what I was trying to do was write this I had two zeros by accident. Should be H twiddle one. So gamma finite directed tree. All right, so I think uh, Tyson mentioned that I had two tilde's, so H twiddle zero and H twiddle zero. So all right, so the slogan connected components All right, the stream pausing occasionally um, yeah, I don't think the frame rate is very good, but, uh, uh, it says my stream is unstable, so that's, um, it's not great. So let's see, can I, can't really simplify anything, fortunately, no, it's, I've got a, I've got a bad, bad stream connection. I don't know why. Yeah, um, and Zoom is lagging really badly. Um, all right, let's pull out the magic string, see if uh, avoiding Bluetooth helps helps things. All right, let's see how this goes. Oh, hello, that's different. And all right, anyway. Um, and I should just note, we love functoriality. So H twiddle is not functorial for arbitrary maps of delta sets. So I've specified base points, otherwise I can't define it. So my function, my, my function F zero. Yeah. 
Yeah, Chris, we can come to that. So, so functorial for maps that send the base point to the base point. So that's a little bit um, even more rigid, more rigid. Okay. So that's just a throwing, sort of using this abstract picture, we can then actually go back and extract something that might be useful. And it will be actually rather useful when calculating things. Um, so what's a good source of maps of cochain complexes? Oh, we've seen that we can get them from, um, like if our cochain complexes arise from delta sets, then um, we get an induced map. But what about other sorts of ones? Yeah, we haven't done spaces yet, space kitter, so um, like topological spaces, so it's so I should say these are I pointed maps. Base point preserving. So something we can do, let's say we have a pair of um, cochain complexes. So let's call the differential here at DA and B. So these are cochain complexes. And um, suppose I have uh, linear maps. So these are complexes of R modules and maps are all linear, so linear maps. Okay, so it's not the data that you would expect. It actually maps from AN to BN minus one. So it's not even in the same sort of class as the data you would use to make a map of cochain complexes. And now we'll define such a thing. So we'll define, um, I don't really have a good notation for this. So we define u linear maps. So this is for all n. Um, <clears throat> and what I'll do is I'll take something in a and I'll send it to, now what can I do with something in a n? Yeah, I don't know about the lag, it's just, ah. Uh, the stream quality has gotten better, the connection has gotten better, so it might just be now my computer that's struggling. So given something in AN, got to figure out how to get, what else can we get, right? We have uh, bits of data around, we have the maps HN, we also have the maps DA, so given a little a in capital A n, we can do two things to it. We could either apply uh, d a, and that's in degree n, or we could apply h n. And now, um, yeah, Tyson, we'll have to, uh, <coughs> oh please, Chris. PowerPoint. Um, but now these things don't live in the right places. Uh, get rid of that little reminder. Um, so DA lives in a capital A n plus one. Now if I apply H n plus one, then oh, that's not going to work. Need more space. H N of A. I could apply brain is lagging to H N plus one or H N of A is now in B N minus one, so I could apply D B to it. And I can add those things together 
and this lives inside bn. So maybe there's a little uh, picture that's worth drawing. H n d a this is d b this is h n plus one so this square does not commute uh, blue is probably a bad color and green's a bad color purely for the fact it's let's put just a, a yellow cross All right a cross in the middle means this does not commute. <clears throat> but using these two maps, I can define my map that I'm interested in. Okay, so here's a lemma and we'll prove this. So if we collect all these over all ends, So let's prove it. So what do we need? So this map sort of less roughly denoted by like D compose H plus H compose D. All right. And if I compose it with D A, I should be able to move it past and get db. Like that. Um, Alright, but we know right, some of these, these, are, these d's live in different places and we know that da squared uh, and db squared are both zero. So apart from making sure all the indices match up, this looks like uh, D, B, compose H, compose D, A on the left-hand side. So this bit goes away. That bit goes away because of the D, B squared. But we've now got to make sure we've got the, the indices correct. So I want to think of this. Um, as going from I'm checking a certain diagram commutes so it's going to be a n b n a n plus one b n plus one this is d a n d b n so uh, this has to be n this map has to be um, <clears throat> mapping out of HN. Let's have a look at the top of the screen. So it's it's uh, this this one here is N plus one. No, no, that's N. Sorry. You can go back and double check putting labels and everything. The correct labels are uh, n plus 1 and n. Okay, so this is going to be dn. Uh, that makes sense, right? I have to do h n plus 1 goes this way. So I do dn first, go here, and then I follow HN plus 1 down here, and I follow DNB here. Uh, yeah, and when you check the other side, it's the same thing, but shifted, but depending, you know, the, the right one comes out. So you might wish to double check that. <coughs> Right, 
and okay so that's kind of a complicated way to get a, a map but it's at least a way that we get it's not just induced by a given map of um, delta sets for instance So this has a peculiar property. So I have a proposition. All right, so I ultimately care about it you know, just stop test. Uh, stream did not stop. Um, it might just be super laggy. I don't know why. So I'm just looking at my OBS preview video pretty jittery okay all right so yeah ultimately we care about like cohomology right the cochain complexes are the midway step all right we we start with delta sets or whatever we cook up cochain complexes and these are somehow uh, the things you can really work with and manipulate and then you calculate the cohomology of them and um, maps in cohomology induced by maps of cochain complexes they are really a thing and so it's good to know what does the map on cohomology look like because it's you know uh, equivalence classes of things in a kernel and in principle you have to choose a representative and map it across and pass to its equivalence class and so you know what are these possibly the things you start with are infinite dimensional so it's kind of hard to know what these maps are going to look like but maps of this form uh they should be yes um <clears throat> yeah so this is sort of left hand side which is this one and this this is the right hand side yeah it's not just writing down like x equals x if you figure out what they should be so this is going to be um, that's a that's a d that's another d so that's a n plus two and that's an n plus one so they really do sort themselves out anyway so if f arises from this construction then the map it induces on cohomology so what is this nth cohomology module of a nth cohomology module of b This map is just zero, sends everything to zero. Which, just on the face of it, it's quite complicated, and the fact that it turns out to be zero is initially quite surprising. But the proof is actually short and sweet. Um, actually, before. I'll do the proof. Time for a short stretchy break. Any questions? You might wish to uh, examine. It's kind of gone off the screen. Let me zoom out just a bit. There it is. It's dropped again. Ah, okay, weird. Um, yeah, my connection to Twitch is apparently excellent. But possibly um, the problem is uh, on either side of that. It's 
might be the pigeons aren't flying fast enough. Hopefully Twitch isn't uh, being hammered for some reason. But I'm, I'm willing to accept that it's probably my computer. Alright, well in the absence of any uh, observations, let me do this calculation. Uh, Alright, so we're going to recall what HNA is. Uh, ping, yes. If we wait about <clears throat> four more inches down the page, uh, I see the words homotopy and cochain in close proximity. Uh, sorry, it's not an H. This is D N. N plus one. The N minus one. Right, so this is just a reminder of what it is. It's this quotient module. Badly written. And so an element in in here. A representative for it has d a n a equals zero. Uh, okay, <clears throat> then h n f applied to this equivalence class is defined to be the equivalence class of f n applied to a. But what's f n? Fn is a slightly complicated thing. Hna plus <clears throat> Hn plus 1. And all the pieces just fit together. It's very beautiful. Oh no, Peng. Uh, given how much other people spoil in this course, you are... You're not doing uh, as bad as them, that's for sure. I mean, the spoilers are fine. Uh, as long as people who are seeing these things for the first time aren't intimidated by the fact all the commenters keep going, is this concept X? Um, <clears throat> so anyone who isn't commenting, uh, some people have seen this stuff before, but not in the way I'm doing it. So. A lot of this material is not exactly uh, well known necessarily. Okay, but I already know that DNA is trivial. That's trivial because of this reason, by assumption. But uh, now I've got the equivalence class of something that's in the image of dn, well dn minus 1, and so that's the same as 0. And a was arbitrary, little a was arbitrary, so qed, end of proof. Alright, so here it comes. Here's the definition. Uh, oh, out of space. All right. A cochain homotopy All right, and so maybe one thing to keep in mind is that we can add and subtract maps of cochain complexes by just doing it point-wise. And so if we had any map of cochain complexes and added on something of the form sort of um, HD plus DH, when we pass the cohomology, that bit just dies off. Um, 
So, Cochin homotopy F to G. So, F and G are maps of cochain complexes. Uh, the second part, uh, Chris, I presume you mean this line here. This is because. Um, uh, it's D of something. Yeah. <clears throat> I should go, whoop, this here is in the image of D n minus 1 B. So in the B cohomology it vanishes. So if I'm given two maps um, from A bullet to B bullet, I could look at what they do uh, on cohomology, you know, so I have just on the side, I have two maps, let's just move it over, All right, so I have two maps induced on cohomology. That's H n. Um, and now, right now it's even worse. Right, these maps are defined on equivalence classes of things in a kernel, but now I have they're different maps, and I'm passing to equivalence classes, and I'd like to know is H n f of a equal to h n g of a right well these are these lie in some equivalence classes so i have to check like are these equivalence classes the same so it's not obvious how you know you want to do this calculation so do you have to find some elements such that you know <clears throat> they lie in the same coset so on right so that's not obvious again if these are infinite dimensional modules it's even harder so Cochain homotopy is a way to figure out that actually f and g are the same from the point of view of cohomology. So I got to get, that's the motivation. Give the definition is it's a collection of maps h n that go down by one. Uh, such that sort of for all n such that f of a that's g of a uh, h of d a of a so there should be all n's everywhere so maybe n n plus 1 n n minus 1 n n okay so we could write that maybe in short as f minus g is d b h plus h compose d a So space kitter, is it a natural transformation? Uh, maybe. Depending on your definition of uh, such a thing. That's a very interesting question, but not one I'm equipped to answer in this course. So as a corollary of both the definition and um, corollary has one R, of the definition and the previous proposition so given so let's say write it as h uh, no, not h f uh, twiddle g 
Um, this is not symmetric. Um, you have to probably take minus H to get a code chain homotopy from G to F. It's not massively important, but this thing has got a, a sort of a first thing and a second thing. Um, then the induced maps on cohomology are equal. So this should sort of a priori be seen as some kind of amazing thing because F and G can be quite different and they certainly like their, their, their difference is some complicated thing. Right? Their difference is this complicated thing that involves the differential from A, the differential from B, we're mixing in these H's of different like that are really these are different functions they're not the same H <clears throat> and then it turns out you pass the cohomology F and G are the same which is really cool because then um, yeah in particular yeah it can do cool things all right any questions Watch my whistle. Comments, complaints, feedback. All right, it's probably one more definition. This course is super heavy on definitions. I don't know if anyone knew that before they joined in, but. So, I mean, you might think, why is this so? Maybe just the proof, minor comment on that, is that um, I mean, it uses the previous proposition, but it uses also the fact that uh, if I have a pair of functions, well, <coughs> f and k, and k is going to be minus g. Uh, maybe just do it outright. Doesn't matter which. So H minus G applied to some representative is the same thing as F minus the same thing for G. Too many maps. Oh man, this is why we invented category theory, Chris. As a as a field. Try to break it down into the smallest possible uh, bits and pieces and reassemble them. Uh, it's in the kernel DNA. And other than that, um, the right-hand side of up here, um, <clears throat> well, that evaluates to zero. Okay, so I've got one more one more definition which I want to say. Um, so we had this notion way way back of H bullet isomorphism and this was a map of I can't remember if it was directed graphs or of combinatorial surfaces but it's a map that induces isomorphism on all the, the cohomology modules we can write this down in, as a general uh, principle so let's say we're going to let So map of cochain complexes. Quasi isomorphism. If uh, H N up 
F It's always a nice morphism. So this is some sort of the, the purely algebraic notion of saying um, <clears throat> instead of like these two spaces have all their invariants the same, it's like these two cochain complexes have all their invariants the same. And when we're cochain complexes arise from spaces, then it reduces to sort of saying, ah, oh, these spaces are indistinguishable from the point of view of these particular invariants. So what's an example of this? Um, so this is a nice one I can do off my head. So let's let um, <clears throat> So let's let a bullet be a long exact sequence. Uh, and we know a bullet as a map. Well, was zero is the cochain complex with all zero modules. And there's a map from a bullet to it because in each degree it's just a n mapping to zero, the zero module. This is a quasi-isomorphism. So that's um, so long exact sequences from the point of view of um, like cochain complexes are somehow linearized um, topological things. A long exact sequence is corresponds to a boring thing. Uh, as far as invariants go. I mean, maybe there's extra data that's interesting for other reasons, but as far as like cohomology goes, this is uh, not very interesting. Uh, what else? <clears throat> um, yeah, so here's, here's one, one reason why we care about um, cochain um homotopies wow josh uh, that's a pretty bad frame rate um it'll be better once we're in the tube because it won't be it won't be obs um another thing to think about is let's say i have a pair of maps f of cochain complexes from a to b and g from B to A and if um, <clears throat> let's do A and let's do F then G All right so this is a map from A to A uh, and I say and so there's a co-chain homotopy between G composed F and the identity of A and one going the other way then um, <clears throat> F and G are both quasi-isomorphisms. Uh, Tyson, uh, did you mean example one? Yep. So HN bullet of A is K 
kernel of D A N image of D A N minus one <coughs> equals zero because these are equal. And this is true for all uh, for all N because it's exact everywhere. And you just have a map to the zero module and it turns out the source of that map is zero. So as far as number two goes, and I'll just say this before I wrap up, um, uh, I think Space Kid has gone off the deep end. Matters that I appreciate, but I can't comment on now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, why are these both quasi-isomorphisms? That's because when I pass to cohomology, HN of G composed F is equal to, well, it's HN identity of A, but HN is a functor, and so this is the identity of HN of A bullet. But also, HN is a functor, so this is HN G composed HN F. Right, so now we got to start to get to see the power of functor reality uh, and we have uh, HN F composed G. So up until now I would have might have been like, well sure, it's functors a thing. But now we start to use the axioms plus this little result. So this is identity of B 